All right. Good morning, everybody. It is 9.02, so we are going to get started. Um, show of thumbs, how was reading this week? Thumbs up, did all the reading. Thumbs down, did none of the reading somewhere in between. How about uh, comprehension? Uh, I understood it. It was so easy to understand this book. Thumbs down. What the heck is this book about? It's somewhere in the middle. Okay, awesome. Um, let, let me pray for us, and then we'll get going. Uh, Father, thanks for this morning that you've given us, another morning to, to come together and to spend time in your word. And, and God, we ask that, that during this morning that you would stir our hearts to a deeper understanding of you, that you would, you would shape us and mold us into the image of your son through your word. And God, that you would prepare and stir our hearts for worship in the next service. So God, we love you and we need you to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this last week we've been reading through the book of Job. We're going to finish Job this week. And then I think it's either on Wednesday or, or Thursday. We're going to read Psalm 1 and 2 because we're finishing the Psalms this week. So if you've been doing the Psalms, you'll have read all the way through the Psalms. And then we're going to restart that on a cycle of reading one a day. And we're also going to start the book of Proverbs this week. So we have, we have a lot going on this week. So just a reminder that um, uh, these four books, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Uh, these are all considered the wisdom books in our Bible and by scholars, and they're connected with these overlapping connections. So Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes are all linked together by this phrase, the fear of the Lord, or the fear of Yahweh, that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of understanding. And we've seen that already in our reading in the book of Job. So same thing in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, that will show up. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs is, are all connected with uh, Solomon in some way. They're associated with Solomon. We know from our reading in Kings that Solomon was the wise king. So because those last three have association with Solomon and the first three have association by the phrase fear of Yahweh, the, those four books are put together into the collection of wisdom books. So they're dealing with wisdom. What does it look like to live practically in this world as God's people? What does it look like to live in a fallen and broken world before the return of the Messiah? What does it look like to live faithfully in a world full of unfaithfulness? So that's where we are right now. But before we dive in, we finish the book of Job. So we're, we're going to think about the end of the book of Job. I want you to turn to your neighbors, and maybe if you're sitting by your spouse, maybe you turn to another neighbor, and I want you guys to discuss the question, why is the book of Job in the Bible? Not what is the book of Job about, but why is the book of Job in the Bible? I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to discuss that with the person sitting next to you. Go. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> well, we're getting five You can get Okay. All right, everybody. All right. Um, some of you are like, this is my favorite conversation. Others of you are like, I exhausted my bank of knowledge in 30 seconds. But I'd love to hear from some of you. Why, why do you guys think, um, as you've been reading, we're over halfway through this book. Well, why is this book in the Bible? Yeah, Daniel, what were you thinking? Okay. It emphasizes the God's control in a great way. Mm. Okay, so maybe why do bad things happen to good people? What what else? Maybe someone from, from this section. Yeah, Mike? Well, there's a couple of spots in the Bible that are usually used when God speaks of character of man. Mm-hmm. Right? One of those is David. Yeah. Right? When he called David a man out of my own heart, mm-hmm. and then he had this direct conversation with Satan about uh, Job's character. Yeah. His integrity. Yeah, he calls him blameless and upright. When God says that, I mean, we can say that about each other, but God says that about him. We want to find out why. Like, what was it about Job that God would have to mm-hmm. And that's what gets me about it. So, so maybe you see this book as being like a like a character study into the life of one who is actually blameless and upright. What does that actually mean for someone? And then how can we emulate it, maybe? Yeah, okay. Others? I saw yeah. unhelpful but well-intentioned advice of the friends of Jim. Yeah. Uh, maybe wrong application to seriously good truth. Yeah. Yeah, they start off with really good intentions, right? In chapter two, it says that the friends came to show sympathy and comfort to Job. And first they just sit for seven days and it's like, this is fantastic. And then they start speaking and you're like, okay, like you're trying to give some advice. And then they're just roasting Job over and over again. It's like, you guys are horrible. Friends. Like Job tells them, y'all are bad friends, <laughs> bad, bad friends. Um, yeah, so maybe it's an example for us of how not to comfort people and how not to apply our right theology because the, the friends most of the time have right theology, but then they're tracing their theology to wrong applications and wrong conclusions about Job himself. Uh, maybe, maybe one other. Why, why is this book here? Yeah. Uh, it shows uh, human <laughs> struggle and human outside nature, right? How that, that interacts with people. Yeah. So how God relates to human suffering. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, especially a lot of the friends where, where the friends, their theology is insufficient, is they just conclude that God is transcendent and not close. Like he's so far off. He's so far above us that he doesn't really care about us. And he doesn't care whether we're righteous or unrighteous because he has no benefit from that. But the book of Job is trying to show that actually God is imminent. He's really close to us in our suffering. Um, Here is one reason why I ask that question. Because in this book of Job, um, none of these people that we're introduced to are Israelites. Job is not an Israelite name. Um, The friends' names that we get introduced to in chapter two of Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Naamathite. Like these aren't, these aren't Hebrew names. They're not Israelite names. And even as we were introduced to Job at the beginning of chapter one, uh, we find out that he's a, a man uh, in the East here in, um, let's see, where is it? In verse, where is it? Yeah. What verse is that? Verse three. Yes. Verse three, the greatest of all, I have it highlighted. I can't see it. The greatest of all the people of the East. So the book introduces you in these first two chapters that, that these are people who are not Israelites. Uh, so that's why I, I, I wonder that question of like, okay, the Bible is a production of the people of Israel who are in a covenant relationship with Yahweh. 
Um, the only books, there's only a few books in the New Testament that aren't written by Jewish people. One of them being Luke. Luke is a Gentile and he writes the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, but he was um, a partner in ministry with Paul. So he has close association with, with the Jewish faith. So this story is a story <laughs> all around people telling us what happened to people who aren't Israelites. So that's why I immediately am like, okay, well, why is a story about non-Israelites in a book that is produced by the Israelite people? So this book has a lot to say to the covenant people, even though the people in it are not necessarily the covenant people of Israel, but it has something to say to the covenant people. And we are now the covenant people. So it has something to say to us as well. So let's just like do a quick overview of where we've been. So if you remember last week, we're introduced to this man, Job, and uh, he's blameless and upright. The, the narrator tells us, the one telling us this story, writing this down, tells us that Job is blameless and upright, and he feared God and turned away from evil. So that right there, we're being introduced to him as blameless, upright, and one who fears God. And he, he's greatest of all the people in the east and he has large prosperity i mean this is a very wealthy man and by by any standards we we would look at him and say like he's almost like a kingly status as far as how great he is and even in some of his his statements as we're reading through he talks about how princes come to him and listen to his wisdom so it's like man if princes and generals come to job to listen to him what is job then like he is this kingly figure and then we're introduced to the throne room of God, where God is sitting on his throne. The sons of God come to him. So the, the other spiritual beings and one among them is Satan or, or the adversary who comes up and is raising an accusation. And, and as he comes to God, God calls Job my servant. And remember, that's a, a, a phrase that's only been used for a few key figures so far. Moses, David and then the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. So my servant, Job, and here is what God thinks of Job. There is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. So God here, he is affirming that statement that we read in verse one. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? So in the, the heavenly throne room, uh, Satan's raising an accusation, uh, not just against Job, but actually against how God runs the universe. And, and what he says is, you know, the only reason that Job is really faithful to you is because you give him really good things in response to his obedience. Basically, Satan's accusation against God in this context is, God, the only reason the, the righteous people remain righteous is because you're rewarding them. But if someone loves you because you give them gifts, that's not actually love at all. So that, that's the accusation that, that Satan is making. And so therefore he's saying the way you run the universe is not actually a fair and just way because it doesn't lead to true righteousness. So then God allows Satan to strip things from Job's life. Uh, first, all his flocks and his family are taken away. And then the scene repeats itself in chapter two, where God is in his throne room. Satan, all the sons of God come and Satan comes. And again, after Satan stripped everything from Job, again, God says in verse three of chapter two, that Job is my servant, that there's none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. In other words, to make him suffer for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin. So this is the next thing that, that Satan says. We said, well, you just took his possessions. But if you take a man's health, then he will curse you. So then uh, God allows Satan to attack his health and, and to strike him with like these boils all over his body. So, so Job's sitting in the, the dirt and he's, he's scraping his skin with, with shards of a pot because he's in so much pain. And, and even his wife comes to him and she's like, you're, you're such a fool. You should just curse God and die. You know, the, the, the wise words of a wife behind a strong man in the ashes. And then Job's friends come. Job's friends come. And, and we, we mentioned this last week. This is like a little sidestep out of the story. Um, Eliphaz the Temanite. Um, Eliphaz is a common name for um, Edomites. 
and Timon is a descendant of Esau. So there is a tribe of the Timonites from, from the descendants of Esau. So if we're trying to date the book, it would probably, or the person of Job, it would probably be sometime after Abraham and Isaac, because Isaac has Jacob and Esau, and from Esau comes Temanites, and they're Gentiles. They're not Israelites. But these three friends come, and they are here to show sympathy and comfort for Job. And if you were to give a rating, thumb up, thumb down, of how the friends do, how would you say they do? Bad friends, really bad friends, except for the first seven days. They're really good. There's two chairs up here. There's three there. There's a few at the tables. The, jo the Job's three friends do a really bad job of comforting Job. Really quickly, it turns into accusa accusations uh, and theological um, ninja re where they're just trying to hurt Job rather than um, heal Job. Uh, and if you remember from, if you were here last week, we talked about this paradigm. This is what they're, they're operating under. They're, there's these three realities and they're holding these in tension and they're, they're trying to figure out uh, which ones are true. And for Job and his friends, they see no way how all three of these could be true at the same time. So one uh, statement is that God is good and just. Another statement is that Job is innocent. And another statement is the retribution principle. In, in other words, that God runs the universe according to this retributive principle where if you do bad, you receive bad, and if you do good, you receive good. And, and they're building that theology from, from things like we have, like Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy, where there's the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience, or like the book of Proverbs, where, where if you are a wise son, your father rejoices, things like that. And for Job, he is always going to maintain that he is innocent. So he's going to wrestle back and forth with, well, oops. Well, God, I am innocent. So God is good and just. So God must not give the evil what they deserve. And he must not reward the righteous. That's one thought that Job has sometimes. Other times he says, well, I'm innocent and I do think that God runs the world based off the retribution principle, but because I'm innocent, maybe God is not good and just. So sometimes Job even questions God himself. But for the friends, they are dead set convinced that God runs the universe according to the retribution principle and that God is good and just. So they see no way for Job to be innocent. And that's why as we're reading through, all of a sudden they start making these wild accusations against Job. Like, you know, maybe you didn't take care of the poor or maybe when there was an orphan, you like kicked them on the curb and, and you shoved them down in the mud. Or maybe you didn't help that, that older lady with her groceries to the car. And they just start making these things up because they're in their mind. God runs the world according to the retribution principle and God is good and just. So therefore Job must be guilty and that's why he's suffering. So they don't have the inside scoop that we have uh, of the discussion in God's throne room. And, and then we're invited into this where we're, we're just watching a conversation happen. And the conversation is really complex. So throughout the emails, I try to just give you the gist of it and kind of help you get the thrust of what's being said. But they just sit around this circle. I assume they're sitting. Uh, we never are told. Maybe they're standing and pointing fingers. But they're just sitting, and they're all kind of sitting around Job. And they go back and forth where one friend will speak, and they'll say what they think. Then Job will respond. Then the other friend will speak and say what he thinks. Then Job will respond. And then another friend will speak and say what he thinks. And then Job will respond. And over and over again, they're having this discussion. And it just gets more and more tense. And we as readers, we just get invited in to sit and to listen to this conversation. We're, we're just the curious bystanders, and, and, and basically we're functioning like um, Eliphaz, or not Eliphaz, I'm sorry, uh, Elihu. Have we gotten to Elihu yet? Yeah. Today? All right, I, I read ahead, so I, I wasn't sure. So Elihu is going to be a guest appearance, fourth friend who shows up. And he starts off by saying, you know, I, I'm younger than all of you guys, so I, I waited to hear what you had to say first before I, I spoke. And so we're basically sitting along with Elihu, where we sit and we listen to what they're saying. So what is their conversation? What are they trying to accomplish in their conversation that we've read so far up to cha through chapter 27? So chapter 3 to 27, what are they trying to do?
Maybe someone from this quadrant. <laughs> Yeah, provide um, explanation or insight to what the heck jo God is doing in Job's life. Yeah. Anyone want to add to that, build off of that? What are they doing in this conversation? Mike, I saw your hand pop up for a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all thinking, okay, there is this principle of justice that God appeals to, to then run the universe. So it, it's almost as if justice is superior to God in their understanding, rather than being a part of God or even something that God is working in and through, rather than something that God is held to. So are you asking for something as simple as the fact that you're asking a question and they're answering the question? It's... Up to you to decide yes. what I'm asking. I mean, I look at that and say, it's a teaching tool for us, but it's also the idea that what we have to say is important. Mm -hmm. Both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you restate that? <laughs> if he's going to ask a question out loud, he's going to get an answer out loud. And it's not answered from answer that he needs because she's mm -hmm. saying job asked a question and they're trying to answer correct. It. okay great yeah and maybe they're also trying to wrestle with this with god mm -hmm. why is this happening to job and so as they talk and on it more and more and more they become more set mm -hmm. and yeah come to that conclusion hold on to that mm -hmm. yeah so they're wrestling themselves so just chapter on chapter of people wrestling Hmm. Because uh, they're trying to figure out this idea what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I, under, underneath it all, I attribute um, an understanding of retribution. So it's got to be, there's got to be something wrong with it. And so I don't think, I don't look at, I don't look at any condemnation because mm -hmm. they are responding just like I would. Mm. They have empathy for Job. They're acting on their pressure. Which I would have acted on. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're we're basically just going to finish the book together. Uh, and it's not it's not one of those things where it spoils the ending. Uh, this book is more about the journey than it is about the conclusion. So um, go ahead and jump to Job chapter twenty eight. So they have these ongoing discussions. My plan for us is we're going to read Job 28. Uh, we're going to look at the very beginning of Elihu's speech, and then we're going to look at God's speech and the conclusion of the book. And hopefully we have time for all of that. Um, Job 28, even though the, the ESV heading says Job continues, where is wisdom? So these little headings that we have in our Bibles, um, those are added in by translators, trying to just like help us get the gist of what is going on. Those aren't part of the inspired script. So, so maybe even some of you, if you don't have an ESV, maybe yours says something different there. Um, or maybe if you were reading a CSB, you would have more or less than maybe an ESV does. So those are helpful, but they're not inspired. Um, and uh, almost all scholars uh, agree that this chapter, it, it seems so disconnected from what Job was saying before and what Job is saying after. It, it seems more like this is a different voice. So it's not Job. Perhaps it's the narrator of this book, the one who's actually like, writing and telling us this story. And they've almost put a pause in the programming to tell you about what you've been experiencing. Because when we get to Job 29, we're going to hear Job's final speech. And then we're going to hear uh, the surprise guest of Elihu, and it's going to be Elihu's final speech. Then we're going to hear God finally answer Job. And then the story concludes. So, so this is just like a pause in the programming and a reflection of like, what is going on? Have you guys seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life? 
Uh, you know, like the, the, the stars that are like actually angels that every now and then it just shows like these twinkling stars and they're giving commentary on the story going on. That's like how I think of Job 28. It, it, not actually a star talking, but it's commentary on what we've seen so far. So these friends have been talking now for uh, 14, or 24 chapters nonstop. And then we get this. Surely there is a mine for silver, a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from the ore. Man or humans put an end to darkness and searches out the furthest limits. The ore in gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the places of sapphire and it has dust of gold. Uh, right, so it's talking about the, the ingenuity of humans. Hu humans are able to go where no one else is and to go into the earth and to excavate sapphire and gold and ore and then fashion it into tools. They're able to take from the land the, the harvest that feeds people. And yet the the ground itself, if you just go down, it seems to be like this oven, this furnace that would actually just burn up food. But humans are, are so, their, their ingenuity to bring things out of the earth is amazing. The path that no bird of prey knows and the falcon's eyes has not seen it. The proud beast has not trotted it. The lion has not passed over. In other words, humans can go places where no other animal goes. The, the bird of prey cannot get there. The lion cannot go there. Man puts, in, puts his hand on the flinty rock and he overturns mountains by the root. Man, a, a human can just take a little piece of flint, sharpen it into a tool, and then can burrow into a mountain, can actually remove a mountain from where it stands. He cuts out channels in the rocks and his eyes see every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle and the thing that is hidden, he brings out to light. So not only can humans dig tunnels deep into the earth, but they can also redirect rivers. They can shut up waters with a dam. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man, humans can do all of this. Humans are really good at finding treasures in the earth. But where can you find wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep or, or the, the ocean says, it's not in me. And the sea says, it's not with me. You can't buy wisdom or understanding for gold. You, you can't make an exchange rate on the marketplace. Silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire, Gold and glass cannot equal it. So there's no amount of wealth that could ever equal the, the value of wisdom. Nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is far above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it. Nor can it be valued in pure gold. We have this question again. From where then? Does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? You know, human, humans can do a lot. We can, we can excavate the riches of the earth, but riches of the earth don't even come close to wisdom. So where can we get wisdom? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. So can humans find wisdom? No. But God? Well, God knows where it is, and he knows its place. He looks to the ends of the earth. Uh, from his vantage point, God sees everything. He sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning and the thunder, then he saw it and he declared it. He established it and he searched it out. 
And he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. And then Job took up his discourse again. So it's just this little pause in the program where, uh, where I think the, the author is, is just kind of telling you, what have they been doing this entire time? They have been searching for wisdom. The friends, along with Job, in their conversation, they're having this argument, basically, and they're trying to find wisdom. Wisdom it is knowledge that is applied. It's applied knowledge. So if you know what a hammer does, that is knowledge. The moment you pick up a hammer and you hammer in a nail, you are wise. So that is what wisdom is. They're searching for wisdom, understanding of how the universe operates. They're trying to do it on their own though. And humans can do amazing things. Humans can pull riches out of the earth, but they can't pull the riches of wisdom out of their mind. Wisdom has its source in God. And God here says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Remember back in Job, the way God describes Job? There is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. So you're introduced to Job as someone who's wise. He's wise. He's not perfect, but he is wise. And then we pick up final speeches. So that's Job 28. So this entire book is revolving around wisdom. It's a wisdom book. And it's where, where is wisdom found? Is wisdom found through articulating your doctrinal statements and then drawing out false conclusions? No. Is it by arguing with each other and attacking one another to to show that you're right? No. So this question of what is wisdom and where can we find it? That's really what this book is driving us towards in the midst of suffering, finding wisdom in the midst of suffering. Then Job gives a final speech. And in his final speech, he's basically just saying, God, I want to speak to you. My, my friends are idiots. I would rather speak to you. And then he gives a few examples of how um, if he were guilty, that he would not want to stand before God because he knows that he would face destruction. Uh, but he gives his case over and over again. He says, I, I made a covenant with my eyes not, not to look upon a woman. If I, I in any way have committed sin, make it known, but I, I really don't think I have. So that's why I want to speak to you because I know that I'm innocent and I know that you are righteous when you have people in your presence. Then we get to um, Job 30, 32. And we have the surprise guest, Elihu. The Super Bowl performance, halftime performance. Who, one, one of them was not like listed on, on who was going to perform. Was it 50 Cent? He, was, he wasn't mentioned, but then 50 Cent like appeared. And he was hanging from the ceiling and he did his so- song. So this is like 50 Cent hanging from the ceiling. Like, you didn't know he was in the scorecard, but here he is. Okay. Elihu. Elihu is interesting. Elihu is a Hebrew name, first of all. He's the only Hebrew name in this book. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous or he was right in his own eyes. Then Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, burned with anger. He burned with anger at Job because he justified himself rather than God. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Um, So first, a few things about Elihu. Um, Elihu um, is a Hebrew name. He's the son of Barakel, or God blesses. And he's also from the family of Ram. Now, not everyone named John is the same John, but uh, I think biblical authors uh, include information for a specific reason. Can we think of any Israelites who are important who are named Ram? Hmm. Daniel, you got an idea? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. And Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. So, is it the same Ram? I don't know. 
Could it be? Maybe. I mean, like, why include that detail when you're introducing us to Elihu in Job chapter 32? Elihu is a Hebrew name. Barakel, that's a Hebrew name. Buzite, Hebrew name. Ram, Hebrew name. So why tell us that he's from the family of Ram? Maybe it's like cluing us in uh, to, to what type of origin Elihu has, that he's from the line of Judah, but also having being the son of Barakel. He, that's kind of like a priestly name. God blesses. Um, so maybe we're just being clued into who this Elihu is, that this is wisdom, Israelite wisdom now coming through Elihu. We don't actually know, but if that was the same Ram, that could also help us date the person of Job. Um, but anyways, Elihu is angry for two reasons. He's angry both at Job and at the friends. <clears throat> Notice that he's not angry with Job because Job thinks he's innocent. That's not why he's angry at Job. He's angry at Job because Job has spent his time trying to show how he's right rather than show how God is right. In in his moment of suffering, Job is fully capable of holding his innocence while still also pursuing to show God as being the one who is in the right in his moment of being innocent yet suffering. So that's why he's angry at Job is because Job has taken focus on himself rather on defending God. He's angry with the friends though. I I think for for a much worse reason, they have no answer yet. They're declaring Job to be wrong or they're declaring him to be unjust, unrighteous, even though they have no support for it. So just keep those in mind as you read through um, Elihu's rebuke of Job. It starts off really great, but over time, Elihu basically, I think in his anger and frustration, he gets a little pointed with Job and he ends up making the same accusations of, of the friend. But, but one thing that's great that he says in chapter 33, after saying, hey, I'm, I'm young, so I've waited to speak. But one thing I do know is that just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. And just because someone is young doesn't mean they're foolish. So now I'm going to speak and I have a lot of words, but even the spirit's going to keep me refrained from saying all of them but here are some of them. And then in 33, as he's speaking to Job, uh, starting in verse five, he says, answer me if you can. Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Behold, I am toward God as you are, or I'm, I'm for the Lord as you are. I too was pinched off from a piece of clay. God is my maker as well. Behold, no fear of me needs terrify you. My pressure will not be heavy upon you. Those verses are about his tone with Job. He's not attacking Job. He's being gentle with Job. He's like, you don't, you don't need to be afraid of me. I'm not your enemy. And, and I'm not going to lay it heavy on you. So if you're thinking through like, well, how do I talk to my friends in pain or my friends I disagree with? Uh, maybe 33-7 is like a great one to store up in your heart that they shouldn't have need to be terrified of you and your pressure on them shouldn't be heavy. So, so be gentle, even though uh, Elihu is very firm and, at, and direct with Job. But now we're going to jump to the speeches of of God. So God answers. We're going to go to Job 38. And with the time we have, my plan is just that we would just read these and hear God speak to Job. And I'll try and give a little bit of color where I can in clarity. Because remember, Job keeps crying out. I want to speak to God. I want to speak to God. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind. What's a whirlwind? His presence. What did you say, Karis? A tornado. Is that the VeggieTales thing? Well, I haven't seen VeggieTales, but I know I was watching the kids one day in the back room at our church office, and they were watching the story of Job, and there was a big tornado, and I wasn't sure if it was VeggieTales. Daniel? Nothing is impossible with God, Daniel. <laughs> All right, but, but you said a massive storm. Yeah. Uh, has God shown up and spoken in a storm at any other time in the Bible? What times? Sinai. Remember Mount Sinai? God comes down in the, in the clouds and there's lightning and there's thunder and the people are terrified. So God's covenant presence shows up in these storm clouds at times. Um, so here God is showing up. And he's going to speak to Job. And, and all throughout the book, Job's been having questions for, Job, for, for God. 
He wants to speak to God because he wants to ask God some very specific questions. And here's how God shows up. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action or gird your loins like a man. He says, Job, get ready to fight. Let, put up your dukes. Let's go for it. Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. So he says, he says I know you want to ask me questions, but instead first get ready. I'm going to ask you some questions first. We're going to start there and see where it takes us. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, all the divine beings shouted for joy at the moment of creation. Where were you? Or... Who shut in the sea with doors? Who, who keeps the sea from not just overtaking the land when it burst out of the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no further. This is the limit of the sea. This is where the ocean line is. No further than this. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? Uh, jo Job, are you the one who, who makes morning happen every day? Do you make the sun rise every day and cause the dawn to know its place? Uh, do you remind the sun every morning that, hey, you're supposed to rise from that side? Rise up. And it, makes, and it might take hold of the skirt of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Job, have you entered into the springs of the deep or walked in the recesses of the deep? Do you, do you go to the source of the ocean? Have you walked the marauder's trench? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Do you, do you even know how big the earth is? Declare if you know any of this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Job, do you know where the sun goes at nighttime? Where, where is it? Do you know? And where is the place of darkness? You know, where is darkness stored up during all that daytime? that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then and number of your, and the number of your days are great. So Job, you must know. You're, you're so, so old and wise that surely you know these things. Have you entered the storehouse of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble and for the day of battle and war? Job, it's not always snowing. Where, where am I keeping the snow right now? Where's the hail right now? Because on the moment that I need it, I will call it out of the storehouse. What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Job, where does the wind come from? Where is that stirring up? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt? You know, humans can stop rivers. But who makes the rivers? Who, who made the rivers in the first place? And who carves out the way for lightning to strike and to bring rain on a land where no man is? Job, there's so much land that has no human to cultivate it. And yet someone's watering that land. To bring rain on a land where there is no man, on the desert to which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass. Who's the gardener out there? Has the rain a father or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of Pallades? So now we're talking about stars. Can you bind the chains of Pallades or loose the cords of Orion? 
Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their seasons? Or can you guide the bear with its children? So talking about the constellations, Job, who, or can you even, are you the one who controls the change of the constellations throughout seasons? Can you change the constellations themselves? Do you know the ordinances of, he- of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you, Job, lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of water may cover you? Can, can you just say, all right, clouds, bring down the rain, and they listen to you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Uh, Job, are you the source of wisdom and understanding? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together? Job, Can you hunt prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thickets? Now, moving on from the the macrocosmic order to the microcosmic order and talking about animals and the wild animals. Job, do you feed the lion its food? Or who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of of food. Are you the one taking care of the wild birds? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch and bring forth their offspring? Are you, and are you, are delivered by their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out and do not return to them. So think about the mountain goats. Do you know when they're going to be born? Do you give birth to them? Are you the caretaker? Do you know how long they'll be with their mother until they leave to never return and to go about their own path and their own journey? What about the wild donkey? Who let the wild donkey go free? Who loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling? He scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. He ranges the mountains as his pasture and he searches after every green thing. You know, Job, there are wild donkeys who have no earthly master and yet they have a master who takes them onto pastures and who feeds them. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on him because his strength is great? And will you leave to him your labor? Do you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather it to your threshing floors? What about the ostriches? Those big ostriches. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly. But are they the pinions and plumage of love? Are they the wings of love? (laughs) For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground. An ostrich lays an egg, then just leaves. Job, who takes care of the egg? How does the egg hatch? How does the egg have life? Forgetting that her foot may crush them as she walks away and that wild beast may trample and that wild beasts may trample them, she deals cruelly with her young as if they were not hers, though her labor be in vain. Yet she has no she has no fear because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no share in understanding. When she rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. So the ostrich just lays an egg, then leaves. Job, do you take care of the egg? Do you keep the egg from getting stepped on from a wild animal? Do you protect that young little ostrich hatchling as it comes out of the egg to find food and to find protection and shelter? What about the horse? Job, do you give the horse its strength, that thousand pound stallion? Do you clothe its, its neck with a mane? Horses are beautiful. Do you give the horse its beauty? Do you make him leap like a a locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. You get near a horse and it snorts in front of you, you take a step back. They are powerful and scary creatures. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. A horse laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver and flashing spear and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, 
he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shout. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wing towards the south? Are you the one who informs the hawk it's time to migrate south? Time, time, time to go south for the winter because it's going to get cold here. Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the rock he dwells and makes his home. On the rocky crag and stronghold. From there he spies out the prey. His eyes behold it from afar. His young ones suck up blood and where the slain are, there he is. And the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Job, you're trying, to, you're trying to find fault in me. And should you be able to fight with me? He who argues with God, let him answer. You, you want to argue. Okay, now is your time to speak, Job. Go for it. Uh, Sean Duncan translation. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am of small account. What, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, I, I have no response to you right now. Then the Lord answered Job again out of the whirlwind and said, dress fraction or gird your loins like a man. Get ready to fight. We're not done. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Do you, do you have any accusation against me? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Uh, does, does you saying I'm wrong make you right? Have you an arm like God or do you have strength like me? And can you thunder with a voice like mine? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. So in other words, this little section, do you have the strength that I have? Well, if you do, how about, how about you run things the way you think they should be run? How about you clothe yourself in this power and strength? And then I want you to go about and I want you to punish everyone who's wicked. And I want you to reward everyone who's good. In other words, Bruce Almighty, the movie, Jim Carrey, when, when he has this encounter with God and then God says, you think you can do things better? And, and he lets Bruce Almighty be God for a day. And it's like Bruce trying to figure out even how to answer prayers. So he sets up like an email system and he just gets overwhelmed. But this here is God saying, you really think that you could do better? Uh, all right, fine. Uh, punish those who are wicked and reward those who are good. Do it. Do it all. Then I'll know that you have the strength to save yourself. Keeps going with his discourse. Behold, behemoth. Um, so he's going to talk about these two um, wild creatures. There is lots of discussion about what they are. are like, Are these like mythical creatures? Or are these just weird words for really normal creatures? Like some have said like, oh, the be behemoth is the hippopotamus and the leviathan is the alligator. So is it just a normal animal or is it some extinct animal? Um, I don't know. We don't know. It, it's something crazy, but, but listen to how they're described. So the, these are, are both creatures, both behemoth and leviathan that are very dangerous creatures. Um, they are deadly to you. They will kill you if you encounter them. And, and throughout ancient culture, they are also spoken of and they are spoken of as like these chaos monsters, basically. And um, especially like in Canaanite tradition, there's a story about the Canaanite God having to fight Leviathan, the chaos monster, to bring about creation. So this is going to be God's statements about these, quote unquote, chaos monsters that are dangerous. Behold, behemoth, which I made just like I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold his strength, his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinew of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is so strong. He's the first. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. In other words, I didn't have to fight behemoth to bring about creation. He's one of my creations. I made behemoth. Uh, so let him who made him bring forth 
near the sword. In other words, the one who created him, he's the one who gets to kill him also. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shadow, the lotus tree covers him, the willows of the brooks surround him. It, it's almost like he's first getting described as this, this wild, strong animal. And now it kind of sounds like a playful puppy that's like laying in the fields of the flowers. Like this is how God views Behemoth. It's just like this cuddly creature that he feeds on the mountains who rolls around under the lotus tree. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he's not frightened. A raging river does not bother Behemoth. He's just like, oh yeah, a little, little stream. He is confident through Jordan rushes against it, though, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? In other words, can you tame Behemoth? Can you tame Behemoth? What about another creature? Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Leviathan is um, this, this animal that is spoken of living in the waters. So can you draw Leviathan out with a fish hook? or press down his tongue with a cord? Like, can you capture Leviathan? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Are you gonna have a gentle conversation with Leviathan? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird or will you put him on a leash for your girls? It's just like a, a, is this a pet you can tame? No. Will, will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him, not in prayer. Lay your hands on him. <laughs> Remember the battle. You will not do it again. In other words, you try and wrestle with Leviathan, you're going to lose an arm and you will never make that mistake again. Because Leviathan is dangerous for you. Dangerous for you. Behold, the hope of man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not keep silent concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his goodly frame. In other words, God is saying... Leviathan is part of my good creation. I I'm proud of Leviathan. I'm not going not gonna to be ashamed of Leviathan or not talk about him or his goodly frame. Leviathan is good. I created him. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who can come near him with a bridle? Or in other words, who can skin Leviathan? Who could tame Leviathan? Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth is terror. His back is made of rows of shields. Shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezes flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. This should be like terrifying for us, not for God. God's like, this is great. This thing is awesome. I made it. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame comes forth from his mouth. In his neck abides strength and terror dances before him. The folds of his flesh stick together, firmly cast on him and immovable. His heart is hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. At the crashing, they are besides themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The things that you view as very strong in this world, Leviathan sees it just as a piece of straw. The arrow cannot make him flee. For him, sling stones are turned to stubble. Clubs are counted as stubble. He laughs at the rattle of javelins. His underparts are like sharp pot sheds. He spreads himself like a threshing sledge on the mirror. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him, he leaves a shining wake. One would think the deep be white-haired. 
On earth, there is not his like, a creature without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. These two creatures that you view as very scary, but God views as very good and beautiful part of his creation. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now he quotes God's question. Who is there that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Again, he quotes God's question. Here and I will speak. I will question you and make you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. There's the conversation. So Job keeps wanting to talk to God. I want to, I want to talk to God because I want to ask him some questions about what's going on in this world and why I'm suffering. So God shows up and, and, and Job says that he sees God because he's in the whirlwind, right? God shows up. First, he goes through the, the macrocosm of the universe, talking about the stars and the deeps of the waters and the land. And he just peppers Job with all these questions about the dynamics of the universe. And then he turns and he focuses on the microcosms of this world. And he starts talking about the wild animals and, and the beasts in, in the field and the ostriches for crying out loud. And he just asks Job questions like, do you take care of them? Are you the one that makes the grass grow? Are you, are you the gardener who, who waters the wilderness and takes care of that? Like you, you have one acre of land and you do a measly job there. And yet who takes care of these lush fields in the mountains? He asks them all these questions. And then he proposes two very uh, interesting portraits, that of Behemoth and that of Leviathan, which um, is commonly viewed as, as like bad things because they're chaotic, because they bring about harm. And God says, these are not bad things. These are a part of my creation. If you tangle with Leviathan, it will turn out bad for you, but they're not a part. They're not bad. They're a part of my good creation. So he's showing Job, one, there's a lot more to the universe than Job understands. But he's also showing Job that not everything in the universe is bad just because it causes harm. Like Behemoth and Leviathan, they're actually good things, part of God's beautiful creation. Remember, as we've been reading through, Job wants to know, why is God making me suffer? Did God answer it? Not really. He didn't say, hey, Job, here's why you're suffering. Instead, he just showed him things beyond Job's understanding. So what God is doing and what this book is doing is God is, is by his statement, he's asking Job to trust him. Trust him without an explanation. Here's what's like, this is going on in your life and God gives no explanation for his suffering. Not once does he mention Job's suffering. So it's just calling us to trust God in our suffering. Job's statement here, I, I spoke of things I did not understand. He, he, so he's humbled by that. And then he has two statements at the end. Um, and they get a little hard to understand. So he says, therefore, I despise myself and repent in, the dust, in dust and ashes. So when he says, I despise myself, this word can mean hate or reject. So either he's saying like, I hate myself, I despise myself. Um, or he's saying, I reject myself. Because remember, Elihu's anger with Job was that Job was so focused on himself rather than on God. So he could be, okay, I actually reject my, myself. And then you probably have a footnote for repent. Anyone? What does what your guys' footnote say? You're not in your head. Oh, or am comforted. Yeah, or am comforted. So this word repent here, it could mean, um, he could be saying, I repent. He could be saying, I'm sorry. Or he could be saying, I'm comforted. Um, and remember all the way back in chapter two, Job was in ashes. He was sitting in ashes when his friends came to comfort him. So have they left the ashes in the story? No, he's been sitting in the ashes the entire time. So maybe now he's saying, I'm comforted. Um, a little bit later, this same word is going to show up when his family 
his friends and family are going to come and they're going to comfort him. So it's the same Hebrew word. So either Job is saying that because God has answered him in this way, um, he's saying, I repent, which would match with him saying, I reject myself. Or these are two different statements. He's saying, yeah, I reject myself. I, I repent from, from my, my own like, self-interest. But also now in my ashes, I'm comforted because God has spoken to me. Even though he didn't give me an answer to my questions. Instead, he's just called me to, to trust him. But he, God got down on my level in the ashes and he spoke to me. So maybe that's what's bringing Job comfort. Then the story concludes. Let's, let's read the, the ending. We'll, we'll read the ending and then we'll go back into it and like check out some like cool links to the rest of the story. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So my servant Job spoke of me what is right, but you didn't. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job will pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly or according to how you think the universe works. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed, when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comfort, just like the friends intended to do. Comforted him from all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, or 2,000 oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter, Jemima, and the name of the second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapuk. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. The end. How about I say one thing and then I get your question. So we can get to this point and um, we can maybe think, oh, what like a, almost like a horrible end to the story. It's just like, it just like reverses everything and then it makes all things better. So it almost like loses the thrust of it. That's one way people have, have gotten to the end. They're just like, oh man, this kind of like spoils it. It, it makes it not as good. Um, the other error that we can make is we could actually read this and say, ah, God is rewarding Job for his faithfulness. But what we have implicitly done, if we say, oh, God's just rewarding Job, is we have now become the friends again, and we're operating under the retribution principle, where we say, ah, because, God, because Job did good, Job gets good. But that's not the point. Uh, here, what we see is God's blessing of Job is simply out of God's goodness and his wisdom. Not because Job like did something magical to earn it, because it's not like Job ever became a, a non-blameless man or, or a non-upright man in God's eyes. God always saw him as my servant, as one who speaks rightly of, of God. But God is just faithful to Job in a unique way where he blesses him in the, towards the end of his life. So that's how Job ends. Questions? And then we'll hop back in and look at a few other things. Yeah, Mike. Sorry. Right. Absolutely. Job did not suffer because of his sin. And I think the book does give an answer why people suffer. It's just not like the direct answer of they're suffering because of this. 
people suffer in this world because of God's wisdom. God in his wisdom is bringing about uh, the most good and most beautiful existence for his creation possible. And somehow that involves suffering. Somehow God's, in God's uh, economy of wisdom, suffering plays a role in his glory and our goodness. But yeah, Job did not suffer because he was committing sin. Um, so I, I know when I first read the book of Job, uh, when, uh, well, I didn't like read it. Like, I skimmed the beginning and then I skimmed the end. And in the middle, I was just like, I don't understand what's going on. Um, but I had, you know, like semi-decent homardiology, theology of sin, where I knew Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then I jump into a book like this, or maybe just like have a discussion about a book like this with some friends. And I say, well, yeah, uh, Job must have sinned because no one is sinless. Therefore, Job is being punished for his sin. And I immediately become the friends where I start with good, right theology, but then I draw wrong conclusions. And I think the entire book of Job is like paraphrased in, in Jesus' encounter with the blind man, where his disciples say, um, Rabbi, why is this man blind? Is it because of his sin or his father or his parents' sin? And Jesus says, neither. He is blind so that the glory of God will be revealed through him. He is not blind or he's not being punished because of parents' sins or because of his own sin. So God is just. That is an attribute of his. It's not like he's part just. He is fully just. But that doesn't mean that the universe fully reflects his justice. Um, Because if God were to operate the, the world right now according to retribution principle, where the moment you do something bad, you receive something bad, then we would not be here. We would not exist. And if we're really going to apply like our Romans theology, it says that God passes over former sins in in patience so that we can be restored, so that we can be redeemed. And it's God's patience that's supposed to lead to our repentance. So, So God operates the universe based off of his wisdom, not just based off of his justice. And that's what makes God also an imminent God and not just a a distant and transcendent God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And part of it is obviously all of them are fantastic. So how would you build confidence mm-hmm. to the point that it can derail them and hold up mm-hmm. and stay faithful and all that mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. God rewards them? How can we be as confident as the world is mm-hmm. if we've walked with God so confident? Yeah. 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 So, so just remember, he's not getting rewarded at the end. But, but yeah, so he, he has to have sinned. Well, at, at, he has to have, yeah, God restores him. Good. Um, he has to have sinned at some point, but he's not being punished for his sin. He is blameless and he is upright by the author's remission and by God's own account of Job. He is blameless and upright. So how can we have such confidence to, to even approach God on these standings? Well, actually, we have all the confidence in the world because we approach God based off of the righteousness of Christ. We are clothed by the blood of Christ. And the moment we start thinking, I actually can't approach God because I'm, I'm sinful, is the moment we think that we approach God based off of our own standards. We don't stand on our own righteousness. We stand on the righteousness of Christ. As a follower of Christ, you are blameless. You are upright because you are standing in Christ. You have full access to God. When God sees you, he sees a saint, not a sinner. So yes, we wrestle with our sin and and we say no to sin to be able to say yes to righteousness. But the way God views us is as righteous and we have access to God. That's why we can approach the throne of grace in in boldness and confidence to be able to do that. So um, the lie that we can believe is I, I, I sinned yesterday, so I can't approach God today. But when we're believing that lie, we're, we're believing works-based salvation. That I stand on my own righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ. Why was Job blameless and upright? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. Um, but he seems to know Yahweh, the covenant God. Um, and, and all those who are in a covenant relationship with Yahweh, um, they are are trusting in the covenant promises of God that are fulfilled in Christ. And we'll see that when we get to Galatians chapter three. Um, So yeah, why is Job blameless and upright? We don't necessarily know, but he does know Yahweh and that's probably why. 
um, how can the author say, or how, how can God say that Job spoke what was right about him? Does that mean everything Job said was right about God? No. doesn't mean that every little statement he said uh, was right, but I did I put a little note. So while God does not endorse Job's arrogant accusations, he does sympathetically describe Job's struggle as speaking rightly about me. God condemns Job's friends for presumptuously assuming they know how God works in the world. So I think that the key difference between Job and the friends is the friends assume they have God figured out and they make claims even though they don't have answers. Job, on the other hand, even though there, there's times where he's uh, almost accusatory of God, the entire time he's wanting to speak to God. He's like, I want to speak to God. I want to know what, what's going on here. So he's driven towards God and driven towards wanting understanding while the friends say, we got this one figured out. Here's what's going on. So I think that's why Job speaks rightly. It's because Job does not assume he knows what's going on because he does pursue God in his understanding. He wants God to be the one giving him answers. Does that make sense? Yeah. What do you do with, uh, therefore, by myself? What do you mean? Can you say more? Uh, if he's blameless, he's repenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yep. Great question. So uh, the word repent doesn't uh, just mean repent from sin. Repent can mean to stop or to turn away. So the word repent means to turn, turn away from something. Uh, and the word that's most often used in the Bible for repent is not the word that's being used right here. Um, this is actually a, like a really complex, difficult word that's just used in a variety of ways where sometimes it means I'm sorry. Sometimes it means I repent. Sometimes it mean, means um, I'm removing my decision. Sometimes it means I'm comforted. So it has such a huge semantic range. It doesn't seem like uh, it's you being used in the religious sense of I have sinned, so I'm repenting. It, it does seem to be, if it's repent, he's saying, he's like, I'm removing my request to speak. I, I, I'm done. <laughs> God, you spoke to me. You're right. I spoke of things I didn't understand. So I read that last line in three into that. So what he means by I repent, he's like, I spoke of things I didn't understand. Things too wonderful for me. I'm just going to, I'm going to trust you. Uh, so, I, so Sean, my sister was involved with a group called Joe Scott. Anything about that? Nope. Do you? No. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Anyone? Job's daughters? You know about it? Yeah. There's. Uh, what are you wondering? Uh, what is it? What is it? What was it all about? It's like a Masonic thing. I mean, for kids. So, do you understand Mason? And I'm not saying custody. I'm just saying, if you understand Mason, Job's. Joe's daughters, and then there's one for Christ. Uh, or there's all part of the same organization. Hmm. There's some religiosity in it. There's, uh, I think, some good things that happen in hell, I think. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of not personal relationship with Christ. That doesn't come out. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Mike? So the one thing I've uh, always struggled with is Job. There's another whole book in there called that. Mm -hmm. Where Job does a lot of things that people have. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you hear Job talking like, I'd be better off if I was in a storm or mm -hmm. that type of thing. Yep. You know, and I assume that I can understand that he's suffering, why he would feel that. But the question I have, is that kind of crying out to God like that, saying words like that? Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, th I think so. Um, but both of the Book of Lamentations and also a majority of the Psalms lament like that, where it's just like, I, I hurt so much. Like, it, I almost wish that I, I wasn't even born. And yet, a lament, though, calls God's character into action while um, a complaint calls God's character into question. We're like, God must not be good because of what he's doing doing right now. 
but a lament is crying out to God. And even Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, he says, if this cup could pass from me, let it be so. Like change your plan if it's possible. Um, and Jesus is on the point of death in, in that. So we have 10 minutes. All right, one, one more and then we're going to. Just speak of that. Isn't that like a verse that we talk about God saying so is right? Yeah. That kind of means both approach to how he approached God. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's suffering. He's calling out to God. He wants answers. Um, he's not sure why things are going on, but he doesn't, he doesn't presume that he knows why things are happening. And he doesn't take matters into his own hands either. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Okay, we have a few more minutes. We have a few more minutes. Oh, wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop back in. because Remember the first question. Why is Job in the Bible? Like, why is this book? Is, is it just so that we know that in our suffering, it, it's, it's happening according to God's wisdom. So even though we don't fully understand, it doesn't mean God has not abandoned us and God is still with us in the pit. A lot, that's a great reason for this book. I think there's more to it though. The, the, the biblical authors are very wise with how they write and, and put things before us. So a, a few statements. Remember, um, Job is called my servant. My servant, my servant. Moses, David, and Isaiah, the suffering servant, my servant. Um, now Job here, he is called my servant. And what has the entire book been about Job? Him suffering. Job is the suffering servant who is blameless and upright. Blameless, the word blameless is this word that uh, it's usually always used for the sacrificed lambs being without blemish. So it's almost as if we're introduced to Job as a, a, a without blemish lamb. And he is upright in character. Another word that's used for the servant in, in Isaiah. And Job is upright. He's blameless. He's the servant of God who suffers. And then the friends are told, and all the friends remember that they're not Israelites. They're not Israelites. And they're told uh, to take sacrifices and to, to take the offering to Job and to offer these burnt offerings for themselves. And then my servant Job shall pray for you and I will accept his prayer. Who do you take your offerings to? Priests. So it's like Job all of a sudden, remember he was, he was a priest for his family back in chapter one. And now for these Gentile friends, he is the intercessory priest for them where they come and God accepts his prayers on their behalf. So Job, the suffering servant, prays on behalf of the Gentiles and God hears and responds to this prayer. Again, he's called my servant. And then in chapter 10, I mean, sorry, in verse 10 says the Lord restores, restored the fortunes of Job. And this little phrase restored the fortunes. Uh, it's used, I think 40 some 40 times in the Bible. Oh, 28 shows up 28 times in our Hebrew Bible our Old Testament, and it's always about the nation of Israel, except for this time right here. It's, it's the promises that God is going to restore the people from exile, that he's going to bring them home when they repent. And he, he's going to bring them back into the land and he's going to bring about the messianic age, uh, except for here where it's about Job, the person where Job is being restored from his exile, restore, having his fortunes restored. And then he prays for his friends. And, and then the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice as much. And remember Isaiah 40, verse 2? Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her for her war, where warfare is ended. That her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So that's about punishment going into exile being over. But then in 61, seven, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. So the hope of Israel is for after exile, for them to be restored, their fortunes to be restored, to be brought home from exile and for them to receive double of what they had before. So here is, 
is Job receiving that. And then his friends come and they show him sympathy and they comforted him. In Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people. It's that same word there. So Job is receiving what the promise given to Israel is in Isaiah chapter 40. And then he, we hear about him receiving the double of all these things. Um, and then at the very end, Job died an old man and full of days. We've heard that phrase one other time before, and it's about Abraham. Abraham died an old man and full of days. So why is Job in the Bible? Is it just to tell us about what happened to Job? Well, no, it, it, it's, it's for us. It's for God's covenant people. And, and what this is doing for the covenant people is it's, it's showing this picture of a man who, who suffered righteously and then was restored in relationship to God and, and, and restored to what he has. And this is a very relatable story for the Israelites in exile. This is what they're going through. Job is relatable for them on more ways than one because they see an individual going through what they're going through as a nation. And what we're going to be reading about in the, in the weeks to come are people like Jeremiah, who is a righteous prophet but goes through exile, or Ezekiel, who is a righteous prophet but goes through exile, or Daniel, who is righteous but goes through exile, or Jesus, who is righteous and he suffers and he goes through exile and then he intercedes for the nation. So the book of Job is doing a lot more than just helping us deal with our suffering. It's helping us point to how God is dealing with our suffering in Christ. Um, Let me pray for us. I'll answer more questions if you have them, but let's go worship. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this book. God, even though we're not actually finished in our reading plan, continue to shape us and to mold us. Help us have listening ears and not just be people who try to give answers right away. God, we see the faults in Job's friends and we don't want to make those same mistakes, but God have have mercy and grace for us when we fall short. And God help us uh, who have placed our faith in, in Christ, help us see that we are blameless and upright in your eyes. God, we can come to you in our suffering and we can lament to you. And and even when we don't receive answers to our questions, God, help us trust your wisdom that you're working in both the big things and the small things for your glory and our good. We love you and we need you now. Help us worship from the bottom of our hearts in this next service. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.